Hi everyone, I'm delighted to be with you, albeit virtually. I'm here today to talk to you about an idea with the potential to help solve some of the biggest challenges facing our world. This idea is impact investing, which means investing with the intention to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. It means investing in clean energy, in the circular economy, in sustainable forestry. It means investing in affordable housing, microfinance, graduation out of poverty. It means investing for impact across all types of investment, from debt to equity to bonds and infrastructure. It's an idea that in the last 20 years has gone from the fringes of finance to become one of the fastest growing trends in the investment world. And I'd like to try to answer two questions today. First is how this idea went from niche to mainstream. Second is where I think impact investing needs to go from here. Now, I know that your last speaker of this series focused on social innovation. So to answer my first question, I'll use Everett Rogers' diffusion of innovations. Uh, this is a very personal story for me because my own firm, Bridges Fund Management, was one of the earliest innovators. I launched the business in 2002 with my co-founder, Philip Newbra, and our founding chairman, Sir Ronald Cohen. And we founded Bridges with the idea of investing in businesses that delivered attractive financial returns alongside positive social and environmental outcomes. Essentially, we wanted to make investments that would help bring about what we thought was really needed, a transition to a more sustainable and a more inclusive economy. Now, at this time, the idea was a niche, to say the least. The name impact investing didn't even exist for another five years or so. A lot of the investors we went to to raise our first fund were absolutely convinced that you shouldn't do, do both. You should invest to make money or you should give away money to do good, but not both at the same time. You can't have your cake and eat it, as we say in English. And this polarised notion of economics was pervasive during the 20th century, inspired by economists like Friedman, Hayek, Adam Smith. It was widely accepted that the purpose of business and investment was strictly to maximise returns to shareholders, typically with a pretty short-term view. The business of doing good was for philanthropists and governments. So in this period from about 2000 to 2007, I would say the idea of impact investing was thought by most to be literally breaking the rules of economics, only practiced by a few very mission driven people and a tiny niche. It was thought that seeking positive impact would require a trade off with financial returns. It was thought that social and environmental impacts were subjective and couldn't be properly measured. And it's interesting to note that at this stage, the main investors were foundations and families rather than large numbers of institutional investors. In 2006, I think we began to move to the next stage when the Rockefeller Foundation brought together many of the early specialists to think about how this idea could be more systematically scaled. And it was there that the term impact investment was coined. And out of that also came membership and sector building organisations, the Global Impact Investment Network. In that period, the early adopters began to enter. Large firms such as JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley established impact funder firms or joined the Global Impact Investing Network. In 2007, also ESG investing began to be widely institutionalized when the United Nations created the Principles of Responsible Investment, the PRI. And for us, this is the period in which we published um, the Spectrum of Capital, which is still widely used today, which really illustrates neatly this range of investment opportunities that were developing between the two polar ends of investment for maximum shareholder return and philanthropy, all the way through risking, uh, minimizing risk of harm through ESG, through to investing to solve challenges, impact investing. And actually, it's when we at Bridges realized that the really big idea was actually what we call impact management. The idea that all investments should measure their most material positive and negative impacts on society and be responsible for maximizing the positive and minimizing the negative all investments and all businesses as well. The third phase on the diffusion curve is the entrance of the mainstream, the early majority as Everett Rogers calls it. And for me, that was rooted in the galvanizing call of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, which really gave us an objective roadmap for the impact goals of the world, breaking down the idea that impact was subjective and couldn't be measured. 
Alongside that, the push for net zero, which emerged from the Paris Climate Agreement. And then more recently, COVID, which resulted in increased awareness of climate change and social challenges such as unequal access to healthcare and racial and gender inequality. In a way, perhaps most importantly, um, investors came to believe that a transition to a more sustainable and inclusive economy not only should happen, but actually will happen. And therefore, that investing in that transition will produce superior financial returns. The notion that there's always a trade-off began to be dismantled. So where are we now? It's still in the early majority, but growing really fast. Over the last few years, in particular, we've seen the pace of change accelerate and lots of large mainstream investors joining the early adopters like Bridges and the others in setting up impact investment funds. The majority of the invest- investor capital is now institutional, pension funds, insurance companies, and impact management is now an accepted function on its way to more standardised norms. In terms of scale, the PRI now has over 4,000 signatories representing over $120 trillion of assets globally. And according to the IFC, $2.3 trillion of impact on investments were made in 2020 alone. An impressive number, but only equivalent to about 2% of global assets under management. So not enough. We need to think much, much bigger. So I want to touch on five key things I think need to happen if we really want to change the world for the better at meaningful scale through this. One, global standards for impact management. Now we've moved from mission-driven specialists only to mainstream players joining in. Consistency of measurement, standard norms for analysing and managing impact are more important than ever to ensure transparency and impact integrity. Government and regulators have a key role to play here. Two. A just transition. Net zero is a crucial goal, but how do we make sure that the costs and benefits of this transition to net zero are shared fairly? Um, The most recent G7 Impact Investment Task Force report makes this point really well. It's not only a question of fairness, but also crucial that we bring populations with us in this transition to net zero instead of them rising up against it. Number three, harnessing technology. We need to harness emerging technologies to pioneer and scale new solutions to the challenges we face. We also need to be smart in how we navigate the substantial impact risks of technology, AI, just one example. Number four, democratization of impact investing. Actually, most of us are investors through our contributions to our pension funds. So we can all be impact investors. We can start by making sure that our own pension managers are genuinely investing in a more sustainable and inclusive economy. And number five, blended finance structures. Not all impact investing can generate superior financial returns. We need more sophisticated financial structures, for example, with foundations and governments putting in first loss layers to allow capital to flow to the most difficult issues. So in summary, we've come a long way, long way in 20 years. But to meet the urgent challenges of climate and inequality, we need a dramatic acceleration towards a genuinely inclusive and sustainable economy. Everyone here has a role to play. I look forward to discussing this together. Thank you.